Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Just Two Dads with my co-host and partner, Mr. Sean Francis. I am Brian Altunian. Today marks the beginning of Autism Awareness Month. Uh, we're in April, and uh, I've got a, a, a great guest for us today. Actually, it's going to be uh, amazingly poignant for a lot of folks because we're in IEP season. We're in, you know, there's so many things going on right now happening in our schools and everywhere that having a, an advocate, having an attorney uh, to fight for our children's rights and fight for our, our efforts, um, among other things. Discussion today is going to be amazing. So stay tuned for another episode of Just Two Dads. <music> Welcome back, everybody. I am Brian Altunian, along with my co-host, Mr. Sean Francis. Uh, Today's episode number 129. Sean and I started this about two and a half years ago as just two dads having a conversation about our kids dealing with certain special needs challenges. Um, His son on the autism spectrum, my daughter with some learning disabilities. Recently, my son was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So, uh, basically, I, I get the double badge. I think that's such a thing. Um, but dealing with with um, with family members that need certain accommodations and some support, um, and we just start having a conversation about resources and how people could get access to information and know people who are doing great things in the community. And we decided to give it a platform and create our Just Two Dads podcast. So if you're catching us live on Facebook, welcome. Please leave comments for us. Today's conversation is going to be uh, is going to be great, and, and definitely encourage you and invite you to ask your questions today of our guest Melissa Gagne. Um, if you're catching us after the fact on our YouTube channel, please like and subscribe, share the information. You'll find we're at episode 129, so a lot of episodes of tremendous value of warriors who are out there supporting our community. And if you're catching us on podcast outlets wherever you are, and you want to reach out to us. You can email us at wearejusttodads at gmail.com. Makes it easy. All words, all letters, no spaces or dots or underscores or anything. We are just two dads at gmail.com. And if you're catching us live on WSTX AM radio down in the U.S. Virgin Islands, again, please reach out to us. Let us know if there's anything that we're talking about that is of interest to you, anything that you'd like to know about. If there's a subject matter you'd like us to talk about, or if there's a person that you think we should be talking to, please let us know. So we're going to get into it today. Again, Autism Awareness Month, um, just one of the many uh, issues that we cover here. Uh, but today's conversation is going to be very poignant. So we're going to get into it with, with our guest, Melissa Gagne, in just a second. I'm going to throw it out to, uh, to Mr. Sean Francis. And Sean said, we, we're, we spent a good 10 minutes just trying to figure out lighting. As I joked about with Melissa, like we've done 129 episodes and yet sometimes we still act as if it's the first one. Because that's life, right? That's kind of what happens. We just we, we deal with life as it comes along, and and uh, and uh, anyway, Sean, you look fantastic, and you're dinging like crazy, so that's a great thing. Um, welcome, buddy. How you feeling? How you doing? You feeling good? You feeling settled? Uh, what'd yeah. you say? Sorry. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I'm feeling. I'm feeling anything, but you know what? No, I shouldn't say that. I'm feeling settled, especially all things can uh, considered. Um, I'm uh, at a different location than usual, you know, versus my home studio, because we have some construction going on at home, um, you know, which began with a leak that took place in one of the pipes in our home, but, you know, presented an opportunity as well. But at any rate, um, you know, I, I'm just thankful for us to be able to have the platform that we do uh, to do this and to be able to um, meet with the people that um, the, that we get a chance to interact with and hopefully add value and our guest that we have today is someone that is just you know qualified to speak on many different subjects and it's i think it's it's great to have people on that have all these titles and everything and if you in, in speaking of that you know our guest today is a practicing uh, practicing attorney founder of um the her uh the law firm that she is at uh in the state of connecticut has worked tirelessly for families um, in so many instances, the law firm of uh, Leviano and, Ga- and Gagne, and you know, with all the credentials that she has, as impressive as they are, I'm sure. I'm hoping I'm not speaking out of turn for her, but I would imagine that she probably holds just in uh, as high an order that of uh, 
wife and even more so mother. And she is a mother to um, three children of which her son is uh, diagnosed with autism and faces severe challenges. And she just is a warrior fighting on a daily basis. Uh, so please welcome to the show, Melissa Gagne. Yay. Hi, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Welcome. By the way, Melissa, you're all over social media. Uh, for anybody, like, honestly, for anybody you want to see some great advocacy and some great information, Melissa, well, I'm going to throw it up here on the screen and so we can throw that in the chat in the chat as well. Her, your link tree is a great place for people to find resources where uh, they can they can see you. I, I, honestly, my <laughs> not that I've spent a lot of time on TikTok, but like TikTok and Instagram, all my stuff is is, is filled with 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 Melissa Gagne uh, posts. So I love that you're putting information out there as much as you do. It's Thank amazing. you. Actually, that started, um, it, and I you can follow me at Attorney Melissa Gagne, but the Linktree link is a place you can click and follow me on any of the social media platforms. But that actually started because I, I started doing a parent education, in-person parent education series at a local restaurant that hires inclusively. So 50% of their staff have some sort of uh, a disability. They have job coaches. And uh, in speaking with the owners, my son, Ryan's 26 now, they have a daughter with Down syndrome who's a couple of years younger. Uh, we started talking about community and, and the, the fact that social media in and of itself is so powerful for our families, for special needs families, because there's so much information that I didn't have when Ryan was young. And I started this in-person parent education series to just bring people together. The idea was to create a community where, where families who had kids with any sort of, of a unique or special need could come and get some basic information. Because what I realized early on is people don't, there, now there's so much information in terms of their rights and their legal rights for special education kiddos. Uh, there was some basic information that I could push out that could be very helpful to parents and families and caregivers that they can then use and empowers them to go and advocate uh, on their own for, uh, you know, for their kids. So, so I started with that parent education series, but recognized quickly that um, there's a greater audience for that. So I do push out these very short videos that give some very broad and basic special education law, legal information, IEP meeting tips. And the purpose, again, is for parents to look at that and say, oh, OK, maybe I should look uh, you know, deeper into that. Uh, particular and 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 I get a lot of questions and I get a lot of really positive um, follow up from people who really appreciate just having a place to go to get some of that uh, some of that basic information. So it's it's amazing and <laughs> Sean, I just jumped in. I know you've got a, Sean's got usually a list of questions, but I'm so fascinated <laughs> because first of all, you say local, and so for people to understand, you're in Connecticut, right? And so right. that. That, that cafe that you're at uh, is local in Connecticut. Um, and when we did our pre-show conversation, we generally do this with all of our guests, just take 10 or 15 minutes and you know touch base. For us, it was exciting to see that you were in that cafe at the time. <laughs> right? A lot of noise in the background, but, but you've got to tell us about that, be, uh, about that, that location because it's so, I, we need, this, this should be everywhere, right? We should have these in every city all over the place because it was so, you could feel it through the screen, the love, the support, the, just this is such an amazing environment. Will you talk about that, that place a little bit? Because yeah. that's you started your base and then, and then, and then, you know, all this magic has happened since then. So I know it. It's incredible, too, because when you go in there, my son, Ryan, is really particular. I can't just take him into any restaurant, but even he loves it mm -hmm. there. There is, it's called Beans and Company, and, and it is this incredibly um, you know, thoughtful, deliberate approach to inclusive employment and where you, you, you are 
you look around you and you see that, you know, having some sort of a unique need or disability is the norm there. And it's such a welcoming and warm environment that I go there all the time. It's a couple of miles from my house. I sometimes work from there. The day that we had our call, I was actually working from there because I had somebody doing some stuff in my house. And I, I, it, it's like my home away from home. And that day in particular, what you saw was a reunion of a parent who I had who used to come to those uh, parent education events who had moved out of state. She has a daughter with Williams syndrome, which is very, very rare. And she had come in to visit to say hello. And you sort of witnessed that reunion. But that's the warm and welcoming and wonderful um, atmosphere that Beans and Company promotes. And I agree, there are pockets of these types of places in, in different states, but we need to scale it across the country because there is a whole workforce of people who are, you know, have unique needs and, you, you know, who, who might have special needs, but, but are ready, willing, and able to work. And we need employers that are willing to provide employment for them. And so Beads and Company is just a stellar model example of, of inclusive employment truly at its at its finest. And they created it, Kim and Scott Morrison, who created it along with uh, Noelle Alex, they created it so that their kids would age into a place that they could work. Because as many families know, when you sort of drop off that cliff at 21 or 22, whatever your state it, it may be, in Connecticut, it's 22, um, all of the services and all of the uh, rights under the IDEA sort of fall away. And mm -hmm. you're left with uh, uh, really struggling to find appropriate programming and services for adults with disabilities. So Beans and Company is just a shiny example of how it's possible. It's amazing. It's amazing. We, yeah. if, it, if, if, if nothing else comes out of today's <laughs> conversation, People should know about Beans and Company. You're doing a great service for them, but they're doing a great service for our community. And uh, and God bless them for for having that, you know, for having that location. People can go and make sure that, and we will say this, our very first guest we had on the show was really trying to establish a standard for retail outlets to be able to be, you know, sensitive, of, you know, to the issues and the needs of, of, of families who have family members who have special needs, you know, no blaring music, no flashing lights, like be conscious and, and you know, uh, aware of, of certain needs in a retail establishment, like a cafe or a restaurant or a diner of some kind. Um, and by the way, even like sporting events and all of those things, right? So, so setting some sort of standard. And I think as people become more aware, you're going to find that there's a lot more of us that are theoretically neurotypical, but still have stimulation challenges, right? Or, or overwhelm. Sometimes, you know, you go to a restaurant, the music's really loud or it's, it feels invasive or the lighting is off. These, oh, these places, these locations that are conscious of that and that they create an environment for people to come and patronize, but then more importantly, what Beans and Company is doing is they're also providing an, a place for, for employment as well. What a phenomenal, phenomenal place. So thank you for mentioning them and thank you for uh, by the way, that conversation we had, like they yeah, had you stand up and you were taking a picture as it was, it was a reunion. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Really I know. It, it was amazing. It, it, yeah, and it is. And they really live that. And it's a true, it, you know, it, which, again, we're trying to build a community. I'm trying to find one place that parents can go to get different types of information, right? So with those parent education nights, sometimes uh, I bring in uh, attorneys who do special needs trusts. I sometimes bring in psychologists who talk to parents about managing anxiety as a special needs parent. So um, just so sort of one place to go to get, uh, to get a variety of information. Beautiful. Beautiful. Wow. All right. So I've, I totally took, took over the conversation. Sean, you have, I'm sure you've got. No, th 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 <laughs> things work out for like for a reason. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm broadcasting from a different location today where I usually am not. So I don't know if anybody could tell you probably could, cause it wasn't the smoothest as I was introducing you, you know, I had your, your bio and everything, the email that, that you sent with it. And for whatever reason, couldn't find it as I'm streaming. I was like, uh, you do these great things. You got this title, that, that title. And <laughs> so the whole time that Brian's talking, I'm like, let me see if I can find it because I think the credentials and who you are go hand in hand because I don't want to just also just when well, this person has, you know, a degree from this institution and has done this and done that because what I think what happens is 
people generally speaking can kind of cancel themselves right out if they don't think they have certain credentials or degrees or anything like that. And so, yes, you have those things. But at the end of the day, you're a wife and a mom like anybody else. And you're fighting for your family, not just quite like anybody else. You've taken it a notch up and a little bit. Let me go, go try and be a solution to the problems that persist. And then the other thing, Brian was complimenting you on your social media. If there's anybody that's out there just thinking, does anybody, you know, have an interest in anything I might have to say? I, I know for a fact that you're just doing what you do and, and looking at other people's posts and figure out maybe this adds value, maybe that adds value. I'm not sure. Cause that's the second time we've told you about your social media. And you, the first time we did, your response was like, Oh, I, 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 I didn't know how effective it was. And um, that's this. So, you know, that's to say that if you have an idea that you might be able to add value to other people, it's worthwhile to step out and, do so. And you're just a fantastic example of that. And, you know, they always say that if you're trying to accomplish something worthwhile, especially um, the reason why you might want to do it is a little more important than how you have to figure out how eventually, but the most important thing is the reason why. So with that said, you know, you just do what you do. And I'm, and I'm sure you probably don't necessarily look at yourself as a hero, but you may have heard that before. If you think otherwise, you know, um, you know, we're here to tell you that that's exactly who you are. And every hero has, um, an origin and that's where the superpowers come from and all of that is based on where you grew up how you grew up your, your your journey and everything and it always also has an impact upon how you deal with your child's diagnosis and i'm especially intrigued to hear that story that trajectory from you in terms of chronology and the diagnosis because i believe you are if not uh the guest who had you know who, whose child is the oldest with a diagnosis, pretty close to it. And we always say that the further back you go in time uh, for a diagnosis, the fewer resources are available. So the even more even more of a warrior that you have to be. So tell us about all of that, you know, where you come from, who you come from, and um, how you got to the, the, the place where you are today, the direction you're headed in. So I am uh, originally a Jersey girl. I grew up in New Jersey um, in a town called Bergenfield. And it was really one of those just um, bucolic places to grow up. It's North Jersey, Bergen County. Um, you know, I grew up in a town. I loved it. I loved school. I loved high school. I still have my, my closest friends are from high school. Um, and it, you know, I was really fortunate, uh, you know, to grow up in, in an environment like that. But having said that, I don't recall ever in my school ever seeing a, a, a kiddo with any sort of special needs. Um, at that, you know, uh, I'm, it, you know, dating myself to some extent, but this still happens, not just in Connecticut, but all across the country. It's, you know, the kids mm -hmm. with special needs were sort of segregated into one room. Um, right. But, but so I, I didn't have any experience with that. And actually, when I went to college, I went to the Boston Conservatory of Music uh, to be uh, to major in musical theater. Wow. <laughs> I wanted to that. I mean, that was that was initially what I thought uh, that I wanted to do at the time. And I, I, you know, learned uh, going through there and I did graduate from there, but I learned pretty quickly that um, I probably wasn't um, it, I don't, it probably wasn't the passion I thought it was. And I probably wasn't talented enough to uh, to sort of make it quote unquote. Um, and, and also, I, I don't believe that that life necessarily, the nomadic life was one that that would necessarily work for me. I'm a grounded, like family kind of person. But, but I did love it. I loved performing. And after college, I, I, um, you know, I did, you know, do some performing, uh, but I also needed to pay the bills. So I always say in my story, I'm sort of an accidental everything. I became an accidental teacher. Um, and, and I became an accidental teacher because I saw an ad in a newspaper that a local middle school needed a drama teacher. And I thought, okay, well, I know about the theater and I need a job. And so I went uh, and, and interviewed and got hired to run the drama department at a middle school. And I ended up loving it because I loved working with the kids. And the principal said to me, you know, middle school kids are tough and you're really good with them. And I said, you know, I really love these kids. I really love coming here every day and I love 
you know, bring, creating theater with them. He said, did you ever think about being a teacher? Cause you would be great. And I hadn't, uh, my mother was a Montessori school teacher, but I really never saw that in my, in, you know, in my career path. But, uh, I, so I actually went back, got my master's degree in education from Connecticut college in arts and teaching. I became a middle school, uh, wow. English and reading teacher wow. where I ended up working with, uh, kids who had learning disabilities for the first time and teaching them how to read. And a couple years of, you know, four or five, six years into teaching, my principal said to me, you know, you should really get your administrative certification. Um, and I said, I'm not really interested in being a, a school administrator. And this is where I then became an accidental administrator. Um, <laughs> I went and got and He said, well, even if you're not interested, you should do it because it puts you on a higher pay scale as a teacher. And it gives you greater perspective of how a school is run. So I thought, OK. And I went back to school and I got my 092 certification and my six year degree in education leadership from, uh, you know, from Sacred Heart University. And at that time, um, when I was doing that, I, I had gotten married and I had my son, Ryan. And so my son, Ryan, was born in uh, 1996. And uh, believe it or not, he's actually 26 now. And he... Um, you know, was this beautiful, perfect looking baby. And he developed typically for the first probably 15, 16, 17 months of his life, um, where mm. he was alert and he was, he had language and his gross and fine motor skills were intact. And there were, there was really no concern until one day when he was probably 18 months old, it just stopped. It was like a light, a light switch. You know, it stopped and he just regressed and he lost his language and he lost his alertness. And we saw it physically. Like if you look at the picture of Ryan from his uh, first birthday to his second birthday, you can actually see the difference in him physically. You can see the like, dark circles under his eyes. Um, and I will tell you that I was propelled into... Um, this world of, of autism. And I didn't know anything about it. And I tell this, this particular story, I don't want to veer off too much from my origin story, but I tell this particular story because I think it's important um, for, for especially parents to hear that when I took Ryan to get uh, for the first time uh, to get diet, you know, to a, a specialist, so my, my pediatrician, like a neurologist, yeah. I took him to the premier place in Connecticut that you go. And yep. I'm a young mom and Ryan's, you know, not even three years old at this point. And that, that neurologist said to me, not only does your son have autism, it's the most severe I've ever seen. Oh I don't gosh. think, I don't think there's any chance at, at a meaningful life for him in the way that you would imagine for your child. And I don't even think there are institutions left, but if there are, that that is the type of setting that he may need sooner rather than later. Oh my gosh. And that's he what he does said none to left. And I said, you know, and I said, you know, here I am a young mom and that is how this diagnosis was introduced to me. And I will tell you that that had a profound impact on me as a, as a parent and as a person and as Ryan's mom. Because, you know, it, he took away my hope and I let him and mm -hmm. I, I, I let him because he was the expert and I went through second I, you know, second I, uh, opinions and third opinions. Everyone agreed that he was a severe, but, he, you know, they didn't sort of deliver the information the same way. Um, and that was my introduction, right, to, uh, so, to autism. Just, and, and just so you so, you know, Melissa, uh, my oldest daughter is 27, born in 95. And at 18 months, we, you know, thought that maybe she had a hearing issue. We went to a premier neurologist who, while wasn't as significant in what she said, she did give us in, in a matter of a minute and a half, maybe two minutes sitting with us, a whole list of all the things that she wasn't going to do. An entire list of all the things that she wasn't going to do. It was soul sucking and crushing. Like I can't imagine that people just do that without any care or Sean has a similar story with in the conversation where they give him that diagnosis over the phone. Like it's like no care, no empathy, no concern. And it's, 
and it's horrible. So I empathize with you. I know what that feeling is like because I had that exact at 18 months as well, had that exact same experience. And as I watch you telling that story, I see the emotion in you because I feel it too when I talk about it. I, it's all I can do not to cry because it takes me back to, to that feeling in that moment and the lack of social and emotional intelligence that that, uh, that that medical provider had, that that's what he would say to a young mother who's obviously already struggling. And it, it's something that I now say to people, don't let anyone take away your hope. Because while I, I did the best I could advocating for Ryan in those early years as he got more and more severe and more aggressive, I think that it, 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 it stilted me a little bit. Um, and I think it sure. stunted my, my, you know, and he, and, and it was, a, it was several years before I felt like I was finding my hope again um, for him. And the person you have who, to. Who, then, well, the person who actually helped me do that was the attorney I hired uh, wow. for him. Right. And so, um, and so just sort of, I, I don't mean to, to okay. sort of vacillate yeah, back and forth, going. but. Ryan is such like in that whole experience is, is sort of at the foundation of everything that I've done in my life moving forward. Um, I, I, I went on, like I said, to get my administrative certification and somebody went out on maternity leave, an administrator, and they asked me to sort of fill in. So I became like an accidental uh, first, uh, you know, a department chair and then an assistant principal. And then somebody in a different school was leaving and they said, you know, would you go over there? And I became a school principal. And so mm -hmm. it was, it was, it was sort of like, the, you know, you know, this series of, of, so I was a school principal actually, um, you know, at a, at a school with um, kiddos that were pre-K through sixth grade, although all my teaching experience and admin experience had been six through 12 prior to that, I truly have, you know, 20 years of pre-K through 12 experience um, wow. in the education system. And the school where I was a principal was a magnet school. And so here, what that meant in this particular situation, 50% of my kids were from, were from Hartford, Connecticut, but the other 50% were from about 22 other towns. And so I was working with kids with special needs and I was working with special education systems around the state. And that's where I saw for the first time how pervasive the issues were in terms of parents not getting what their kids were entitled to unless they had an attorney or an advocate at the table with them. And so when I was a school principal, I would... I would act like a lawyer for the this, the kiddos who were in my building. I was I was advocating for you know for services and and so that's sort of where um, the the bug of maybe this is what I should be doing started. And I talked to the attorney that I had to hire for my son, who at the age of six was. Ryan had always been outplaced. So the town that we lived in, um, they didn't, they had never serviced a kiddo as severe as him. And so mm -hmm. he'd been outplaced from day one. And at the age of six, he was in a program where he had, he had been kicked out of programs, kicked out of every camp we tried in the state of Connecticut. Um, he had two one-to-ones in his IEP just for him, designated mm -hmm. one-to-ones. And if one of them wasn't there, he couldn't go to school. Um, and I wow. started to see that that there that no matter what school we were trying, that that he was going to always need more. And somebody said to me, you know, you should really hire an attorney because I don't think they're doing everything or offering everything that maybe your son uh, is entitled to. And that was actually the first time I even knew that there was such a thing, heard that there was such a thing as a special education attorney. Um, and so and that that's. Was and that's 2002 now, right? Around 2002. Yeah, 2000. right. Exactly. That's like yeah. 20 years ago. So this is before Autism Speaks and, and where, you know, the profile of autism hadn't been raised to the extent that it is now. And I was right. just, you know, and, and I was in crisis mode because Ryan was so significant. His behaviors were, were, were had become so unmanageable that we couldn't even drive in a car with him. Um, it was just oh, wow. unsafe. He became unsafe. Uh, it was unsafe for everyone. And, and I hired an attorney who said, you know, listen, um, we don't even know what kind of potential 
there is for Ryan. You don't know because he's so, he's so, you know, he's just not being serviced properly, but with the proper programming, with the right services, whatever that potential might be, you know, let's, you know, let's try to get him there. And it was the first time, like something clicked like, Oh, so maybe there could be more than this for Ryan Mm -hmm. in his life. Right. So I always credit, he's my colleague now, right. Because we practice in this state, but I always credit him for, for helping me find my hope again. Um, for Ryan. Storing hope. Right. And he was Ryan's attorney from the time he was six years old to the five or six years old, uh, till, till he, till he aged out. (laughs) And this is the attorney that you, that you share your practice with now. I don't share my practice with him. Um, um, my partner is Jen Laviano, um, but but mm-hmm. in Connecticut, there's not many of us that practice special education law. Right. So we all consider ourselves colleagues. And I sit on the board of, uh, of a nonprofit, uh, see Connecticut with him. Um, so I consider okay. him, uh, I consider him family. Um, but he is really the one that helped me find my hope and said to me, you should be doing this work. You but that's not be. Jim. That's that that is or is not uh, Laviano. I'm sorry. No, Jen Laviano is not. the one gotcha. that met many years later. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Let me ask you this: Considering when um, the, the period that we're talking about, and to the, to to date, there's still a little bit of you know um, debate back and forth as to well, nobody knows what yeah, has a proven idea as to what causes autism there's a you know there's pro and anti you know vaccination all these types of things did you notice you mentioned looking at um, ryan in the eye between age one and two the difference between the celebration of both birthdays did you is there a a line of demarcation for you as to when you think that that shifted or changed i didn't catch it my wife seems to think that there was most definitely one that occurred after one of the vaccinations that that um, that our son Elijah had. Ask the same question, by the way, Sean. I was I was I just say that it's a controversial topic now because of yeah because it, like in my wife's case she doesn't she doesn't like oh it's because of the vaccines right. it's not a blanket thing it's because you get you know you get them in in, in groups and so you know did you did, did you notice any difference was there a line of demarcation at any point in time and if so was it one vaccine versus the other what might that have been yeah there was a there was a certain right so there was a vaccine and then there was ryan had a high fever and he had a high dose of antibiotics yeah. and it's like that what like it, it, there was I, I can actually remember right right it was within a week that we started to see the regression and while mm-hmm. i'm you know i i i i respect every, the way everyone feels about vaccines. I would go back and back and vaccinate him again. Um, mm-hmm. I, it's I'm not that I would that. It. Um, I had it explained to me. So, you know, again, and Brian, you can appreciate this. I think back when our kids were really little, there was really very few resources right. and very, very little information, but I sort of threw the kitchen sink at it. So, I tried everything that I thought might help. I saw something on Dateline that helped one child. So I dragged Ryan to this one doctor in Connecticut that provided this one shot for a year and it didn't do anything. I tried the diets that they said to try. I tried, you know, I tried everything that I, you know, that I, that I possibly could because the information was so um, hard to get. But one person in particular said to me um, while I'm not saying the vaccine or the antibiotics did or didn't, but what I will say is this, what I noticed is that some kids may have this switch inside of them and that for some kids, perhaps the vaccine or an antibiotic or some sort of something, you know, some, something that you inject into your body can sometimes flip the switch. Yeah. And that was sort of the way it was explained, you know, that, that was sort of the explanation for me. Obviously, as a parent, you're trying to find the why, like right. why, right. like right. how, and why. Um, and once he said that to me, I really let that go because I did blame the vaccine for a while uh, because mm-hmm. it was so noticeable. I did blame the antibiotic for a while. And then I just had to let that go because it wasn't helping me deal with what was right in front of me, which was Ryan in crisis. And, and what and- you needed because you couldn't go back in time. You right. know what I what I what I thought is 
I don't, I cannot be the only person that's ever thought this, but I think it seems like such a unique argument, but the, the one to have, as opposed to arguing whether it's, the vaccine is good or bad. I mean, I guess there's several conversations. People have thought the same thing when it comes to, you know, um, being able to vaccinate against COVID. But given that the issue was, you know, seems to be, you know, the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella, and the fact that when most of us, you know, were kids, you had a short list of vaccines that you got as opposed to this long list and cocktail that they have now. And not only how many you get, but how many you get at a time that right. are putting into a still developing immune system. I'm just a lay person. I'm not a doctor. I don't even know how smart I am. I just, it just seems to, I, I just, it just seems to be reasonable to me that, you know, if there's a question as to how many of them, you know, take place, then why not just, you know, break them up? You know, I don't, I, I don't know. And I think sometimes there's, people that are just more interested in being right than anything else. I just never understand why, you know, um, that doesn't take place. But, yeah. And I, and I, and I think the issue is honestly, the, the, the work that has to be done because all the things that we're talking about now as it relates to our children could be applied to this recent COVID vaccine, which, you know, again, people's DNA, some people are going to react a certain way, right. To the, to, to the vaccination. It's almost as if the work has to be done where, you know, you can explore a person's DNA prior to giving them a vaccine and making sure that the vaccine is going to be effective for that because every child's different. And here's the other thing. I like you, I'm I have a I have two children that are that are neurotypical after my oldest child. So, you know, it's not hereditary, it's not, you know, consistent. You had you have two other children, I'm sure they're also right, they're also neurotypical. Correct, correct. Right? Correct. So yeah. yeah. Every every individual is different in how they respond. Yeah. But I did spend a lot of years, you know, blaming the vaccine. And I know there was that whole movement. And and I think it was more of just wanting to blame blame someone. And, if, you know, I think sometimes, you know, what did I eat? Like when I was pregnant, what did I do? Yeah. Right. You start questioning every move that, you, you know, every move that you made. But when I stopped doing that and I got an attorney involved and we fought and it took us a couple of years, but we got him into a we got Ryan into a program when he was seven. Um the, called the Boston Higashi School. It's in Randolph, Massachusetts, um, because there was nothing for him in Connecticut. And I will say that that school changed all of our lives. It changed the trajectory of Ryan's life uh, incredibly, because yeah. there it was the right program, right? And and think about sending your seven year old in a different state to live and go to school. I mean, it was it was the most gut wrenching decision. Uh, we've ever made. But when we started to, my attorney said to me, start looking, find the place you want him. And then we'll, well, that you think is right for him. And then we'll fight and we'll try to get him in. And that's what we did. And we, we went all up and down the coast uh, of uh, the East coast. And we found this one school and, and he said to me, you'll know when it's the right place, you'll know. Yeah. I, we were there for five minutes and I was like, this is the right, this is it. And it was, and he spent the rest of his, you know, um, educational years there at the Boston Higashi School, and they taught him how to regulate, and how they they taught him everything. And and I always say, you fast forward now. He wouldn't have been placed there if it weren't for my attorney. It changed the trajectory of Ryan's life. Ryan is now living in a group home. He loves. He loves. 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 He's only thirty minutes from me now. He's thriving. He doesn't just, you know, live there. He loves it. And he wow. goes he goes every day to the day program and he volunteers and he and and he talk about the potential, talk about the hope that was stolen from me when he was three years old. Now at 26, he is living a life that I never thought was possible for him. Um, but but it was, you know, his potential and he there's a lot of potential and he continues to to make progress. I think sometimes we think, OK, 21 or 22 and it's over, but he continues to surprise us. I mean, he's still severely impacted. He's still, for the most part, nonverbal. Um, but he is just, um, you know, he, he has come so far and I'm so proud of he'll, you. You say you talk about me being a hero. Ryan's my hero. Because with everything that he has to face, I get emotional, but everything he has to face in a day with all the sensory issues that he has and trying to make sense of a world and not being able to express anything 
verbally um, mm -hmm. when he feels a certain way. And for him to be able to navigate that and be able to function and function well is is inspiring. And so I, I you know, I said I, I left education to go to law school so I could become some like do for do for someone else what my attorney did for me because he changed my life. He changed Ryan's life um, forever. Excellent. Yeah, it's yeah. So, there's so many things we can talk. I mean, like time is going way, way too fast. Like this is a two, hour, two hour. Conference. Wait a minute. Yeah, it's it's moving. I, it's, I, it's, I, yeah. Very. I, I definitely want to cover with you. And this is just so fascinating. And I'm so glad to hear about Ryan's progress. And similarly, you know, all the things that I was told that my daughter wasn't going to do. She now lives in upstate New York. She's married. She drives a car. She lived on her own, which all those things she was told she wasn't going to do. She's a teacher. She's teaching in. Oh my goodness, that's incredible. Middle. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually amazing. And I think it's because, first of all, parents who are advocates and parents, you know, who fight for giving their child the best potential life they can, they can have, especially in light of diagnoses that are so overwhelmingly, you know, negative. Um, but also the potential for every single person is so significant that to write somebody off 18 months old, is, is unfortunately, it's it, it's some, it's such an easy and a, it's a lazy way of, of being when every child has a It's parent. not just, and, and it's not just, and it's funny because this is why we, as long as we're breathing, we should never stop growing. You know, I hope I don't get too off too much on a tangent. That's a dangerous thing with me. But, you know, thinking my thought when I would hear that, because we all know about how, at the very least, you're coldly told about, the di diagnosis, if you call it the never day, things they'll never do, they can't do whatever have you. But my thought used to be just that it's simply cold or it's mean, it doesn't show tact or whatever have you. But the other thing is it's highly ignorant because just like we're talking about the vaccine and how different, you know, immune systems and um, different bodies respond to things in a different manner. So too is a is is a is a person diagnosed an individual. So you don't really know what they're going to do or not do. So any professional that's listening, don't just be tactful. You strike a balance between being tactful and being, you know, operating in objective reality. But at the end of the day, and for parents that are listening, remember that doctors are people with a degree and some practice, and they may have years of doing what they do. But at the end of the day, they're people. They don't know. They still don't know your kid your child the way that you do. You're the one that does. Take from them what you need to get. No more, no less. And then the other thing is that, you know, I'm just sitting there when you talked about what Ryan goes through on a daily basis. I mentioned we have construction going on at our, you know, at our home. So we were going through demo and stuff like that. And we we're trying to prepare my son because he was at school when a lot of it was taking place. And I felt a little bit of angst hearing, you know, walls get knocked out and stuff like that. And that was just me. And, and it made me stop and think. And I felt really almost got emotional just thinking of him. Oh my gosh, the poor guy. Just And I know how thrown off I am. If you know, you, you're you in your environment, you've got your things that you're used to. Any of those things are taken away and you're thrown off. You know, that that can be a, you know, a, a very big deal. So I, I, I'm saying that to say, don't ever stop looking for the empathy and, uh, and as, and, and as empathetic as you think you are and as high as you think your consciousness might, might be, there's always room for it to be raised, um, with our children and with each other. I think in terms of the empathy piece, I think right now the world is experienced, at least in, you know, my, the experience I'm having is there sort of this empathy fatigue, uh, yeah. my law partner, my law partner, Kate, you know, said that to me and I said, there is, there's sort of this lack of empathy, but this was, this was, you know, 23, 24 years ago. And I think it's a lack of emotional intelligence, uh, which I think I, I think some people look think that social and emotional skills are sort of soft skills. And I would argue just the opposite. In fact, mm -hmm. I think it's my social and emotional intelligence that makes me a better lawyer. Um, you know, I went back to law school. When I went to law school, I was 44 years old. <laughs> And I went full time. I, I quit my job in education. I resigned. I went to law school full time. And I was in a class. I was I was I was afraid I was going to be, you know, the weird old person <laughs> in the class. And I was in class with, you know, 30 year olds and, and 29 year olds and 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 
and really just young people. And, and I have to say one of, I, who became, who didn't care about how old I was and, and we became, I, I developed some really meaningful friendships, but something that occurred to me as I, as I started through that program and, and up until the end was how I, I, I thought the emotional intelligence um, of that generation, at least my experience with my peers in law school was so much higher than, than my peers, my age, same age and older peers. And I think that, mm. you know, some of that is, is there's more talk about it. You see it more in schools, there's programs. Um, but I also think that there's, that, that this generation has a little bit more of an awareness of, of, of how their words impact people, especially in extreme situations like a doctor diagnosing, um, you know, a child like, like this doctor did with my, with my son. And so I think it's, it's, you know, I think that the takeaway from that story, what I try to put out there for people is I think there was something inside of me that was like, no, 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 that can't be, that can't be so, but he surprised, you know, it had such a profound impact on me uh, that I, you know, I always, you know, for a long time, I wondered, could I have done more for Ryan during that time if he hadn't done that to me? Because that, and I, I felt very depressed and anxious for a long, uh, you know, I suffered through all of that, uh, yeah. which many special needs parents go yeah. through, which is, you know, mm -hmm. the anxiety of, of when you see that phone number from your child's program pop up on your phone in the middle of the day. And, and usually they're not calling to tell you something good. They're calling because they want to you to pick them up because there's a behavior, there's an issue. Um, right. And that triggers anxiety in, in families. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I do think that there's a better sense of social and emotional intelligence in this in the, the generations that have followed since that particular doctor who was much older than I was at that time. But right. I still think it's a problem. And I still think that um, empathy and, and acknowledgement for families with special needs has a long way to go. It okay. does. It does. And, and, you know, ignorance is not an excuse, but I, I made this post on social media was something hit me when something was said to me once that kind of messed with me uh, in terms of confidence. I'm not even sure if I remember who or what it was. But I was able to step outside of it and look at myself and the emotion that I felt at the moment. And I realized is, you know, one of the worst things you could ever do is to knowingly rob someone of their confidence or their hope, right? And it's very possible to do that unintentionally. It's a bad thing to do that intentionally, right? The only thing that's potentially worse than that is something to which we have a solution, which is to allow someone to rob us of our confidence and hope because people can only take what we allow them to do, but we're the sum total of our experience. So if, if we're not prepared for the theft, we can't exactly prevent it. So, you know, you can't do anything about that time, but, you know, but any professional that's listening, you know, we're never as young as we're never going to be as young as we were when this conversation began. So time is precious. So don't go robbing somebody of their time just folk by just focusing on telling them what their child will or will not do. It, you know, we're very capable of having a realistic conversation and then, you know, telling them about what the possibilities might be. And at the end of the day, we get to control how we, how we respond to that, which is given to us. But when we're caregivers, you know, or parents to all with special needs, you know, you, your, your spiritual and emotional muscles need to be you know a little bit bigger. So it's easier to, it, it's easier to, you know, to suffer that blow. I, I think that we've set the record, at least from my perspective, for this is the fastest hour that we've had in the two and a half years that we've uh, Honestly, I, I have like four more questions I need to ask you in a minute and 27 seconds. Like, uh, it really I was just going to say, in response to that, my clients, when they, right, so when someone calls me, obviously it's not because things are going well with their school district, right? There's obviously a problem. And so one of the things I think they appreciate is the fact, I always say I've sat, I've been at every seat at that IEP table. Like I've been the parent, <laughs> I've been the, the school teacher reporting out on a kiddo, I've been the administrator, um, I've been the district, and, you know, now I'm the attorney. But, what, you know, one of the things that I always say to prospective clients is, um, you know, uh, if you're looking for someone to go in and and start screaming at people like that is not how we practice law at Laviano Gandhi. Like, you know, we, don't, 
don't do that. I have a lot of empathy for what my, and I think they appreciate that because they know I've walked this walk as a parent as well. Um, but, and I understand that by the time I get a call, there's been, there's been, you know, there's been a, a, a break in the trust. I feel like part of my job is to try to repair that. It's not always possible, but I think it's possible more often than, than people think. And to try to work collaboratively as a team, as a member of the team to get, you know, what that child is entitled to. And so I think so often I hear from parents, Sean, in response to what you were just saying is they just don't care. They don't care about how I feel about, they don't care that I'm at work or, or they don't care uh, about how hard things are for me at home outside of those six hours at school. Mm -hmm. I hear it all the time. And then you go into these meetings, right? And, and sometimes the educators are talking about the child and they, they actually tear up because they have so many feelings, you know, for this child. And so I think there's, there's some miscommunication that happens. And, and so I, I, I think there's empathy out there. I just think that sometimes um, these situations become so challenging that sometimes, you know, people don't know what to say. They don't know, they don't know how to necessarily demonstrate support in a way that somebody might need it at that moment. But I do think that um, overall, this empathy fatigue that we seem to be experiencing currently, it's something I hear mm -hmm. on every perspective phone call that I have with a, with a client. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I'm going to have to hold my questions for another time or, or offline. Um, but, I, uh, I'll come back anytime. Right, right. It's been a Great. We'll have you back for sure. Sure, and I'd love to. Yeah. Overall, I think besides, you know, an advocate for families with, you know, with children and their IEP, you, you provide support and services for even adults with special needs and you go beyond just the school setting in the work that you do. Primarily we do, primarily I do ages three to 22. Um, that is the primary um, um, portion of our practice, but that has, that has, um, we do also, you know, sometimes kiddos that have an IEP get into trouble discipline wise. So we handle maybe uh, a manifestation determination hearing. So when a child mm -hmm. who has an IEP is has done something that could put them up for expulsion, uh, the district is required to hold what's called a manifestation determination hearing. And if at that meeting, the whatever the behavior was, was determined to be a manifestation of that child's disability or failure to implement the IEP, then, uh, you know, then they cannot sort of punish him the way they would punish a child who didn't have an IEP and, and, and the, um, the path wouldn't be expulsion. It would be something else. So we do those types of things. We work with families who have children on 504 plans, um, you know, so we do provide that, you know, that type of support, but the, the parent education work that I do, uh, locally in person and, and we'll, we'll be expanding. We'll do some, we're going to be doing some of that online as well. Um, we do invite families that have, um, adults, you know, with this, that, you know, that we're caring for have adults with disabilities as well, because again, the, the idea is to just create community. Um, and I yeah. think people that are like us, Brian, like you and I, who are the other end of it, um, in terms of, for me, it's sort of, um, you know, it's, it's our, my life and it's every day, but, but in terms of the other end of, from, you know, the school and that ages three to 22, we have a lot to offer young families that are just starting out, that are just getting the diagnosis, um, that, you know, our, our look ahead and become completely overwhelmed. And while the information that's out there is wonderful on social media, you have to filter that as well. Make sure you're getting the proper information. We're the best support for each other. So that's what I try to do uh, with, with families, regardless of, of the age of the person that they're caring for. Got it. Got it. And, and special needs trusts and conservatorships and all those types of things you have access to. People have questions about those types of things, right? Correct. Correct. So we, we don't conservatorships. Yes. I refer out uh, the special needs trust because there are in my state in Connecticut, we have attorneys here. We're so lucky that actually that's all they do. 
and they're so they're so experienced that one specific niche that that we have someone who's affiliated with our office that we we refer that stuff out to. Beautiful, good for us to know, and the work that we do in financial services that have access to another resource that that's all they do. So good to know. Thank you. So we have to wrap up, unfortunately, because uh, <laughs> you know we have a time commitment here. Um, but thank you, Melissa, for an amazing conversation and. Um, the work that you're doing and, you know, your, your, your travels, your, you know, your path to getting here. Um, what a, what an amazing experience, an amazing story. So thank you so much and encourage everybody to, you know, follow on social media. Um, I was, we wrap up this episode. Um, I would say is to the point that you're making, I end every episode saying, you know, empathy and love is, is so needed right now. And yes, there's empathy fatigue, but it's still, you know, just having an awareness for somebody else's situation that you have no idea about rather than being judgmental, you know, be, be curious and be supportive and be empathetic, right? Be, be people need, you need, you have no idea what's happening with the, the person, the experience that they're going through. And if you can look at the world through the lenses of love, make the world a better place. So empathy and love always, and especially now. Um, so I want to thank you. Thank everybody for catching us live on Facebook and on podcast outlets. Again, reach out to us at wearejusttodads at gmail.com. Uh, WSTXAM radio down the U.S. Virgin Islands. Thank you for listening in. And Sean Hall, who is our producer out in, in Hawaii. Thank you, Sean, for your support. And to Billy, uh, Billy Footwear for being a you know, constant support, a sponsor with us. Tonight, as a, because it's April's Autism Awareness month uh sean and i are doing a live podcast uh with autism live they're doing a podcast a thon uh ten, tonight i think it's been going on since yesterday it's like three days of podcasts back to back to back to back to back we're going Ooh, live fine. on autism live so catch us tell, on tell them what tell them what the hours represent well it's actually gone beyond that now it was one in 36 have been diagnosed with with autism so initially it was 36 hours of podcast and actually, I think because it's probably higher than that now, it's actually gone to 44 hours of, yes. of podcast-a-thon. So um, uh, Autism Live, 8 p.m. Pacific time tonight, Sean and I will be live and talking about uh, the work that we do and the men's group that we're forming to support men who are part of this community as well. So all that to say, Melissa, thank you for being such an uh, amazing guest and uh, so excited to be uh, to know you and the work that you're doing. And we're going to be in touch with me. other questions that I have for you that we'll talk about offline. Um, but I'm going to throw it to, to close us out. Thank yeah, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun. You're amazing. It's been fun for us as well. And Melissa, I I don't know, Brian. Should I take a shot at the, shot at at, at the question? Do you think Melissa can do that in, in sixty seconds? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. We'll ask it after. I'll, 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 yeah, we'll ask it afterwards. We, yeah, we, we, so this has not only been the fastest hour, but I think this is probably that, I don't know, there's been value in so many great conversations we've had, but this is the most wrapped up we've been where we just go through and like, wait a minute, we didn't touch on this. We didn't touch on that. And it just went right through. But again, I you know want to thank everyone for taking the time to uh, tune in, whether you're doing so live or after the fact, wherever you get podcasts, um, continue to support what, you know, what we do. The link for the men's group known as the den is in the, uh, uh, on the, on the, on the screen, uh, as well as, uh, autism live. And, um, you know, we just want to thank everyone and remember that questions are much more powerful than statements. Everyone needs to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to know that they matter. They want to know that they love. I want to, um, also send a shout out to my family in the U S Virgin Islands, listening to us on WSDX AM radio and our good friend, Robert Moorhead, who, did, uh, took the time to tune in today as well. Wherever you are, just know that uh, we love you and thank you so very much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Last last comment. Thank you, Sean, for that. But by the way, Melissa, just you know, my daughter Jo uh, Jordan uh, is uh, watching as well. So she said to say hello. So that's my daughter Jordan. Hi, Jordan. My twenty-seven <laughs> year old. Um, love uh, lo love the fact that she continues to, to 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 check in to check in what we're doing. Anyways, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you again, and thank you, everybody. We love you, and uh, thanks for joining us today on Just Two Dads.